In 1989, the true comedy geniuses of Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor comes to life on the screen once again in See No Evil, Hear No Evil. The story revolves around Dave, played by Wilder, who is deaf, and Wally, played by Pryor, who is blind. These two friends find themselves in the middle of a crime caper, where they have both the law and organised criminals trying to track them down. Despite the fact that only one of them can see, and only one of them can hear, they must rely on each other in order to get through this ordeal, with many comical shenanigans along the way. Yeah, I know I often use terms like comical shenanigans, but this movie is generally really funny and naughty, and never fails to put a smile on my face. So it's time to check out this classic bromance movie as we explore 10 things that you didn't know about See No Evil, Hear No Evil. While we truly appreciate the comedy chops of Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder. So let's check it out. Number 10, Script Writing Lawsuit Fiasco. The very first script for See No Evil, Hear No Evil was written by husband and wife Joseph Bologna and Renee Taylor. Beforehand, they had worked together on the 1971 romantic comedy Made For Each Other, which they both wrote and starred in, and they would both go on to write and direct fellow romantic comedy Love Is All There Is in 1996, which starred a very young Angelina Jolie. It is said that they sold Columbia Pictures their early script in 1984, for which they were paid $200,000. However, this deal was not a match made in heaven, as after the release of See No Evil, Hear No Evil, the couple would sue the studio. As Wikipedia puts it, they sued on the grounds that they claimed that they were promised extra fees if Richard Pryor would end up starring in the movie. And he did! To which they sued for $10 million. <laughs> wow! We've barely started this episode, and we already have a $10 million lawsuit. I promise you it will get funnier. Number 9. Original Choice for the Lead so with this new comedy movie in the works, the studio were no doubt looking for the right comedic talents to star in the movie. And although two comedy veterans were ultimately cast, originally the production went for an actor who was more in the moment. That actor of course being Jim Belushi. He was being seeked to play the deaf character Dave, and Belushi was increasingly becoming a popular actor at that time, as like his brother John, he starred in Saturday Night Live and the movies Jumping Jack Flash and Red Heat, but he incidentally wasn't cast, supposedly because the studio really wanted Gene Wilder. But I don't think Belushi was too worried, as the same year See No Evil, Hear No Evil came out, he also starred in fellow comedy hit K9, a cop buddy movie with a dog. Not to be confused with that other 1989 cop buddy movie with a dog. Yeah, movies can be weird. Number 8. Gene Wilder kept turning down the part. So as mentioned, the production really wanted comedy legend and former chocolate factory eccentric Gene Wilder to star in See No Evil, Hear No Evil, namely the Dave character. But he really, really, really didn't want to, as he didn't like the script's treatment of deaf and blind people. He had been asked twice, and both times he said no. He was then offered a third time, to which he was going to say no again, until his agent convinced him to go to a meeting with the producers at TriStar Films. Incidentally, after the meeting, Wilder did agree to star in the movie, but he had some conditions. One, he had to make some rewrites to the script, and two, Richard Pryor must be cast in the role of the blind person, Wally. And thankfully, the studio agreed to these conditions, and so he was cast as well as Pryor. And yes, Gene Wilder has a writing credit for See No Evil, Hear No Evil. In fact, not including the writers of the early script, Joseph Bologna and Renee Taylor, See No Evil, Hear No Evil would have a whopping eight writers contributing to the script, including Arne Sultan, who wrote for the original Get Smart TV show, Elliot Wald, who previously worked on Saturday Night Live, and Marvin Wirth, who was also the producer of See No Evil. 
evil, hear no evil, and a few years later would produce the Spike Lee directed biopic Malcolm X. So needless to say, when it came to the script, there was lots of chefs in the kitchen, which usually leads to a weak and disorientated script. But thankfully, that wasn't the case here. I guess you just have to trust in the ways of Wilder and Pryor. Number seven, part of a string of Wilder and Pryor collaborations. So as mentioned, See No Evil, Hear No Evil really showcases the comedic talents of Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder, and their chemistry is definitely second to none, and you can really tell when watching it that these two guys really play off well together, and create magic when they are both on screen. Well, it probably helps that this was actually their third movie collaboration with each other. The first was Silver Streak in 1976, which was very successful, followed by Stir Crazy in 1980, which was even more successful, with that movie becoming Columbia Pictures' third highest grossing movie ever of that time, proving what a winning combination these two guys were. Sadly though, their collaboration efforts ended on a dour note, as a few years after See No Evil, Hear No Evil, they both starred in Another You, in 1991, which was a box office and critical flop. But, meh, they were still a powerful comedy duo, and an on-screen force to be reckoned with. I can actually remember watching See No Evil, Hear No Evil as a kid, and I wasn't aware of their other collaborations as I was just a kid, but I was really excited to see this oddball wacky comedy starring Willy Wonka and Gus Gorman from Superman 3. Number 6, Wilder's and Pryor's Preparations. So Pryor and Wilder's performances are pretty convincing on screen. You do feel that Pryor is blind and that Wilder is deaf, and despite the jokes, their performances are done respectfully. In order to prepare for the roles, they both went to facilities that both dealt with the disabilities that they were portraying. Pryor visited the Braille Institute in Los Angeles, where he learned to correctly use a white stick as a blind person would use it, and even learned mannerisms of blind people by visiting classrooms at the facility. Wilder, on the other hand, went to the New York League for the hard of hearing, and it would prove to be a very fateful visit, as while doing research he was being trained in lip reading by a speech pathologist called Karen Boyer who he would actually go on to marry a few years later, and would stay married to till his passing in 2016. And to think Wilder almost didn't star in the movie. That one split decision he made would actually change the course of the rest of his life. Makes you think, doesn't it? You know, the butterfly effect and all. I mean the theory, not the movie with Ashton Kutcher. Number 5. Gene Wilder still had preservations while filming. So filming started in August 1988, with the shoot taking place around New York and New Jersey. However, during the filming, Gene Wilder still wasn't sure if he made the right decision to star in the movie. He was understandably worried that he was part of a movie that was making fun of people with disabilities. But his mind was put at ease when he would meet up with real deaf people, who would often tell him that people with handicaps do have a sense of humour. As mentioned, this did put him more at ease and make him feel more comfortable. Speaking of the filming, See No Evil, Hear No Evil starred a very young Kevin Spacey as one of the villains, Kurgo. And every time I watch the movie, I can't help but think what on earth is that bulging lump on his face? Is that like his Siamese twin trying to escape out of his body or something? Well, while filming, Spacey did have a cyst on his cheekbone, which he actually did end up getting removed. See no evil, hear no evil, but squeeze all zits. Number four, a member of the police created the music. Yeah, I'm not kidding. A member of the police did in fact create the music for see no evil, hear no evil. Oh, and when I say police, I do mean the pop group, not the law enforcement group. See No Evil, Hear No Evil was scored by musician Stuart Copeland, who in 1977 founded The Police, with him as the group's drummer. Now in the late 80s, Copeland did make a shift to scoring movies, and before See No Evil, Hear No Evil, he did the soundtracks for Wall Street, She's Having a Baby, and the Star Wars cartoon, Droids. And he would continue to score for movies and TV shows afterwards. I like the score for See No Evil, Hear No Evil, 
The main theme in particular sounds mysterious and intense, but that oddly goes with the comedy, and it also has a mischievous sound, like the score is up to no good, which I also really like. Yeah, the music in this film is fun. Incidentally, See No Evil, Hear No Evil was directed by Canadian-American director Arthur Hiller, who previously directed Gene Wilder's and Richard Pryor's first theatrical collaboration, Silver Streak. So this movie was a true reunion. As shortly before making See No Evil, Hear No Evil, he directed fellow comedy movie Outrageous Fortune, which was a great success. So clearly he knew a thing or two about comedy. Number 3. Alternative Titles the movie's title, See No Evil, Hear No Evil, comes from the Japanese proverb of the three wise monkeys. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, which has been around since the 17th century, and its meaning is often thought to be not to dwell on evil thoughts, but it has also been interpreted as an ignorant lack of moral responsibilities. For the sake of the movie, it's a reference to Wally's inability to see, and Dave's inability to hear. Although when released in other parts of the world, the movie's title would slightly change. According to TVTropes.org, in Denmark the movie was called Are You Hearing What I'm Seeing? In Russia it was retitled to See Nothing, Hear Nothing. Italy got the interesting title of Don't Look At Me, I Can't Hear You. In Spain it got the title of Don't Yell At Me, I Can't See You. And in some parts of South America, the movie was called Blind, Deaf and Insane. Which is odd, because neither Wally or Dave are actually insane. In fact, they're probably the least insane people in the movie. Number two, one institute was outraged with the movie. So with an early screening of See No Evil, Hear No Evil, the upper management of the Braille Institute, which as mentioned, Richard Pryor visited to learn more about the challenges of being blind, attended to see the film. After all, according to IMDB, the proceeds of this screening were going to be donated to the Institute. But the upper management was so appalled with the movie, they cut all ties with it, and turned down the finances from that screening. The thing that seemed to really tick them off, once again according to IMDB, was that they didn't like the bad language that was used in the film. It's sad, but I guess they're a professional organisation, and See No Evil, Hear No Evil has some pretty raunchy humour and sweary words in it. So I guess they just didn't want to be linked to that. So instead, the proceeds went to another unspecified non-profit organisation. But it seemed that the backlash of the movie's content wasn't too bad, as according to Gene Wilder, after the movie came out, he received letters from people praising the movie for making people with disabilities as the heroes of a movie, as opposed to just being background characters. Okay. So, there may have been outrage from the blind organisation, but surely the critics were going to enjoy this movie, right? 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 Number one, moderate hit, but hated by the critics. See No Evil, Hear No Evil was released in May 1989 and made just shy of $47 million on an $18 million budget, so it was bankable and did bring in profit. You have to keep in mind that 1989 was a huge year for franchise movies. There were so many big time franchise movies all over the place that year. A year dominated by sequels and Batman. So considering the competition of 1989, it did pretty good. However, the critics really hated it. Although Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor's performances were praised, the movie itself was trashed. The movie was called terrible, stupid, and a real dud, with too many juvenile gags. Even now, the film currently has a measly 27% on Rotten Tomatoes, which makes me sad. Personally, everyone who I talk to about this movie really likes it, and always starts quoting its memorable lines, usually followed by gusts of laughter. No doubt about it, I find this movie hilarious, and it's a movie that frequently makes me chuckle throughout. I mean, I don't think I can ever fully recover from watching Richard Pryor pretending to be a Swedish doctor. That scene leaves me in physical pain, it's so funny. See No Evil, Hear No Evil really shows off the fine performances and craft of Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor. 
It's important to go back and watch movies like See No Evil, Hear No Evil, so their legacy can live on and can continue to be enjoyed and celebrated, as sadly these two comedy geniuses are now no longer with us, making what they leave behind truly important. It may seem like just a comedy movie, but it is so much more than that. So let's keep the legacy of these two great comics alive and continue to enjoy what they left behind, their legacy, as their humour is their gift that they left to the world. So although they're no longer with us, what they have given us will go on forever. I love See No Evil, Hear No Evil. I really do. I also do think that it deserves way more love than it gets. So come on guys, let's go on this journey of getting this movie a newfound appreciation. Anyway, I'm Minty. And why is it all the funniest comedies are always the most controversial? Has anyone else noticed that? See ya.